And this, this, uh, this presentation is called the gaps theory. I'm sure you've all heard of the gap theory, which is the gap between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2. But uh, lately, uh, about you know, a couple of weeks ago, Micah had brought to my attention that uh, you know, there are actually uh, more gaps than just the one gap in those two verses of scripture. And when it comes to the history of creation, there are actually, yes, there are more than one gap. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. And therefore, the title of this presentation is The Gaps Theory, The Gap of Time in the Bible in Regard to the History of Creation. Okay, I'm uh, again hopeful that everybody can uh, hear and see. And uh, if they can't, just let me know. All right, moving on to the next uh, Okay, so the gaps, that word is plural, is that means that there is not just one gap in the history of creation. Creation has occurred over many ages, in many stages, and each one of those, of course, has taken some time to be accomplished. And that's what we are trying to determine is what happened during each age and ultimately why it happened and why it must have happened. So we can read in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, and these are two clauses separated by a comma. In the beginning, God created the heaven as a comma, and then he created then the earth. Okay, so despite all corrupt Bible versions, other than the 1611 authorized version and the King James, all these other corrupt versions have been trying to deceive us for a very long time into believing that God's entire creation came into existence instantaneously or just in a matter of days, which is the six days of creation teaching, or in a matter of days by translating Genesis 1.1 as in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, okay, instead of the heaven and the earth as it is recorded in the 1611 and the King James. So is this the true history and chronology of creation in the Bible? That is what we are going to study to decide what is the truth. So does God really create everything instantaneously or does he plan or does he plan everything first and then execute his plans over the course of time, which can last tens of thousands of years, if not millions of years or even longer? How long creation goes back? That is something we really do not know, but we will find out one day. Okay, so let me just recap the gap theory. Okay, the gap theory teaches that there is a gap of time of indeterminate length between the first two verses of Genesis chapter 1. Again, like in Genesis 1, 1, we just read that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, so when he created, then after that, before we get to verse 2, there is a gap of time of some unknown length. It could have been days, it could have been months, it could have been years, it could have been, you know, decades, who knows, centuries, millennia, we don't know. So there is a gap of time there. And Genesis 1-2, so first came Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and then we get to Genesis 1-2, and the earth was, or we can read this as, or the earth became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The diagram that you're seeing here on the screen, you know, it questions uh, if the gap was billions of years long. See that it says billions of years, question mark. And it talks about Lucifer's flood. Okay. So I don't know if it was billions. In my understanding, it, it has to be at least tens of thousands of years, you know, like 50, 60, 70,000, something like that at the very minimum. Or it could be billions of years. Only God knows for sure. So the gap theory, you know, to understand this here, what we do is we take a quick look at some of the definitions of, of a couple of very important words that I just read from Genesis 1-2, which tells us that the earth was without form and void. Okay, that term, without form, and that word void have a very specific meaning, which teaches us a great deal about what happened at that time in the very distant past when creation began. No, not creation began. After creation had begun, something happened and it brought to this condition of being without form and void. Now, without form is the Hebrew word tohu. 
In the Strong's Concordance, it is the word H8414. And this is the definition which I'm reading from the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew Dictionary. It says formlessness, confusion. Okay? So basically it's telling us that this creation was, if it didn't have any form or shape or, you know, it was just some sort of goo or, you know, I don't know what exactly formlessness means, but it wasn't something that was defined. It means confusion. And of course the Bible tells us God is not the author of confusion. Unreality. And I'm going to jump to 1C, which talks about it being a wasteland, that it tells us that the earth was a wasteland in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and a place of chaos. Okay? All these terms, chaos, confusion, waste, wilderness, okay? these, these uh, show us that uh, Genesis 1, 2 is speaking about a state of the earth, which definitely was not something that was, uh, th that, th that was something that... Uh, that, that was habitable, that had uh, some sort of design to it, some sort of uh, planning to it. It was just like, you know, somebody had just thrown something into pieces and then eventually it would be all fitted into some sort of shape, okay? And then in the Strong's definition, it says from an unroot, unused root, meaning to lie waste, a desolation, a worthless thing. So it's calling the earth a worthless thing in vain okay this this definition in vain is very important as i will just read to you in one minute and again that word confusion empty place without form thing of not something that is of not is something that has no worth no value and you know i kind of doubt that god would have created the earth without any sort of value in the beginning vain vanity waste and wilderness so this is what the earth was in Genesis 1-2. Is this how God created it in Genesis 1-1? That is what the gap theory questions. Because we read, for example, in Isaiah 45-18, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain. Now I read to you from both these dictionaries that the meaning, one of the meanings that they have given to this word without form is the word vain and vanity but god himself tells us in isaiah 45 18 that he created the earth not in vain so if he created it not in vain then it stands to reason that at some point in time for some reason it arrived and it, it and it was transformed into that condition he said he formed it to be inhabited but here the very first definition in brown driver bigs is the word formless okay and again, he strong says without form, but God said he formed it. So if he formed it, how did it come to be without form? Okay. So the earth, as we read in Isaiah 45, 18, was not originally created in vain or without form. Let's move on here. Okay. Now the next word that's used in Genesis 1, 2, which is very important, is the word void. That that without form, that's two words. There are actually one Hebrew word, which I just read to you was the word tohu. This word void is the word bohu, okay? So bohu means emptiness, void, waste, okay? And I like this definition from the Strong's Dictionary. It says it is an undistinguishable ruin. So he calls the earth a ruin in Genesis 1-2. But as I told you just now from Isaiah 45, 18, we, are, we read the God himself that formed the earth and he made it. He established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it. So everything that we read about how God made the earth in the beginning, it, it is showing that it was something that he had planned. He, was, he, had, he had constructed it. He had built it. He had made it a place for habitation an undistinguishable ruin, a wasteland, a desert, these are not places that are habitable. So obviously the earth in Genesis 1-2 was not habitable. That's why God told Adam to replenish it. Therefore, this gap that existed between Genesis 1-1, that the earth that was created in a, in a certain condition, but that was not its condition in the very next verse, it proves that there was some sort of gap. And this definition that we read from Strong's Dictionary in 
Genesis 1-2, that it was an undistinguishable ruin. You know, ruins are not created. The ruins are a result of destruction of something that has that was originally or first created. You have to create something and destroy it before it can become a ruin. Okay. So therefore, these two definitions, they prove very strongly, they make a very strong case for the gap theory. So besides the definitions of without form and void, many passages of scripture quoted previously, I have done, you know, in, in, uh, in, in this, in besides these scriptures, like Isaiah 45, 18, that I just quoted from, I've also done many, many videos on the gap theory, and I've proven that the gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 is a fact. It is not a theory. Now I would like to introduce the idea that biblical history is so long and it is so ancient that there is not just one gap of time in several places in the Bible, but many gaps of time that will help us to understand the history of creation more accurately. I will add links in the description when I upload to YouTube for those who want more detailed evidence from the Bible of this gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, because that gap is not the gap that I'm going to be talking about today. I just did a little recap of that for you though. Okay, here we can see, you know, there are at least five videos on my channel, on my YouTube channel. And uh, this is a screenshot of five videos that are posted on this topic in YouTube. And by the way, while we're here, I just want to mention that I also have a channel on Odyssey. And I would suggest that, you know, viewers should subscribe to that as well, because we never know when YouTube may start terminating channels that speak the truth as they did with my first channel about three years ago, okay? So we have the great gap theory of creation, gap theory further explained, what created first in creation, light or darkness, more Bible evidence proving the gap theory and long gap of history between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. So these are all the videos that I have already done on this subject. Okay, so although the gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 is that gap with which most people are familiar, this is not the only gap in the first two verses of Genesis. So let's take a look at Genesis 1-1. And it will soon become obvious that there are at least two major divisions of time in the very first verse itself. Therefore, there must be a lengthy gap of time in this very first verse itself. When we read this verse correctly, at Genesis 1-1, as it is written in the 1611 authorized version of the English Bible, which later came to be known as the King James Bible, it will become obvious that the very first clause of the complete sentence in verse one, in the beginning, God created the heaven has a history of its own. And most likely just this part of that verse in the beginning, God created the heaven, took tens of thousands of years, if not millions of years to transpire. So here I've copied this verse from the 1611. And as you can look at it on the screen, it says in the beginning, God created the heaven. That's the archaic spelling with a U instead of a V and a comma and then the earth, okay? That is how this uh, verse is written in the 1611 authorized Bible. The grammar of Genesis 1-1 as written in the 1611 authorized version in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth proves the following. Heaven is singular, not plural heavens. Therefore this verse references the creation of just one place, not the countless heavenly bodies that follow later in time. Please don't reference any Bible that translates Genesis 1-1 as in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If there is error in the very first verse of the very first book of the Bible, you can rest assured that there will be plenty of errors in the rest of that translation, as for example, in the NIV. Both heaven and earth are capitalized in this 1611. You can see capital H, capital E, okay? which means that these are both proper names of two individual places, which are the most significant, significant places in God's creation, okay? 
So heaven represents spirit. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of, you know, uh, deep study here as to what the significance of the heaven and the earth is and why God th did things the way that he did. Heaven represents spirit. God is spirit. Okay, God is a spirit being. You can read that in John 4, 24, where Jesus said that God is, a sp God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, therefore the spirit of heaven, the, sorry, the city of heaven, the current habitation of God is meant to be inhabited by God who is spirit and by creatures of spirit, the various races of angels and other creatures that are also spirit and not flesh. The earth, on the other hand, represents flesh. The earth was created to be inhabited by creatures of flesh, not spirit. The sons of God of Genesis 6 and the book of Job were flesh and blood, and they were the first inhabitants of the earth. Much later, after several ages of time, the earth was given to the race of man, beginning with Adam. Okay? So moving right along. So the heaven represents spirit. The earth represents flesh. Spirit and flesh were separated in the beginning. They were both in different locations. Okay, Spirit up above in the heaven and in the heavenly realms and flesh on the earth. And also in kind of species, the, the, the inhabitants of the heavenly realms, they are spirit beings, the inhabitants of the earth they are flesh and blood species. Heaven is above and the earth below with an unsurpassable barrier, the firmament between them. God, who is spirit and other creatures of spirit, such as angels, inhabit the city of heaven and the heavenly realms. Creatures of flesh like the sons of God and later man would inhabit the earth. God's plan from the very beginning has been to unite spirit and flesh by himself taking bodily form and ultimately to unite heaven and earth as will happen in Revelation 21 when the new heaven, new Jerusalem comes down to the new earth. Okay. The union of spirit and flesh, which first happened in the womb of Mary, when a body of flesh was inhabited by God, who is spirit, and from that union was born the first spirit flesh being, namely Jesus, who is God-man, who is spirit flesh, not just spirit and not just flesh. This has been God's plan from the beginning to unite spirit and flesh by himself taking bodily form to replicate himself in a body of flesh to make a living body consisting of many individual living members who would all be flesh yet inhabited by God through the spirit. And we can read that in Ephesians 2.22, that God is working and making us into a building in which he can have habitation through the spirit. Okay, The commonly taught lie that angels had relations with daughters of Adam, meaning the spirit beings were able to plant seed inside creatures of flesh is nothing short of blasphemy. Only once in the entire history of creation has such a union of spirit and flesh taken place, and that happened in the womb of Mary. This is what makes Jesus unique, makes him the only begotten son, as written in John 3.16. He was and will always remain unique in that he will always be the only being that was born of a woman, but without a man or an angel as his father. The only spirit flesh being that has ever been born in this manner. So the commonly taught lie that angels had relations with daughters of Adam, meaning the spirit beings were able to plant speed, seed inside creatures of flesh and nothing. I'm repeating this year, but it is, it is worth repeating because it's such a common lie that this is a blasphemy. If angels could have such power, then there would be many spirit flesh creatures and Jesus would not be the only begotten. Many others would claim that they were begotten in a similar fashion with a father that was spirit and a mother that was flesh. No spirit creature can unite with the creature of flesh and produce offspring. Only God the creator has such power. And to assign this power of God to angels 
as I said before, is downright blasphemy. Hmm. Okay. So now that uh, we have discussed, we have recapped the gap theory between Genesis 1.1 and 1.2, I want to move on into the ages of creation. Okay. In the beginning, the Bible tells us in Genesis 1.1, God created the heaven and the earth. Beginning with the heaven, creation can be divided into four ages at the very least. The first age of creation, known as the golden age, is the only age of time, the events of which were concerned with building and construction. You know, I read to you from Genesis 1-2, the Strong's definition, he called it uh, a ruin. You know, uh, he called the state of the earth in Genesis 1-2 uh, as in a very ruinous state, okay? But that is not how God's creation began. And when I get to Proverbs 8 in this, uh, in this study and other passages of scripture, for example, in Job 38, you will find out that the earth in the beginning was a magnificent place, which was perfect, okay? And it was only later on that it came to be in that state of ruin. So the first age of creation known as the golden age is the only age of time, the events of which were concerned with building and with construction, not with tearing down and destruction, or with reconstruction, as happened in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. So these are the four I kind of skipped over that one. Let's go back. These are the four ages of creation. The golden age. This is the time of creation before evil was born. Okay. So that time first started with the creation of the city of heaven and the inhabitants that would live in it. And then with the creation of the earth and the inhabitants that would occupy the earth, namely the sons of God. So all of that happened during the golden age. This was the time when there was no evil. There was no death. There was no corruption in God's creation. It was build, 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 build. And that's why how long that time lasted, I would venture to say that that was the, probably the longest of all the ages because construction as a rule always takes longer. Destruction, on the other hand, can be visited very, very quickly. As we know in the time of Noah, for example, you know, like what took thousand plus years to build, 15, 1600 years was destroyed literally in a matter of days. Silver Age, okay. What happened? Why did we go from the gold to the Silver Age? Because something entered God's creation, which is called evil, which is the birth of evil. And then this was no longer just an age of building and of construction. Evil brings with it destruction and corruption. So corruption entered into God's, God's uh, creation. And although that age was still very advanced technologically and with everything that they had, the knowledge and understanding that existed, it was still not the same as the golden age. It had the, the process of deterioration and of decay had begun. That's the silver age and it began with the birth of evil and the evil is born first in the race of angels. Bronze Age. The Bronze Age is when these evil angels were imprisoned, but evil continued to mature and grow still as God needed it to in the flesh and blood sons of God, okay, who were the, so evil moved from the heavenly realms into the, in the heavenly creatures to the flesh and blood realm onto the terrestrial realm of the earth. And what we see today, the ruins that were seen in Genesis 1-2, the evidence of which still exists all across our earth, that happened probably in the Bronze Age, and that's what we see today. Everything that existed in the Golden Age and in the Silver Age is probably long gone. There is no trace even probably left of it. Therefore, I would venture to say that all these ruins and in, uh, in all the megalithic ruins, et cetera, and places like Machu Picchu, they are from the Bronze Age, which was the age of Lucifer, as we shall see. And finally, we get to the fourth age, which is the Iron Age. And this is the present age of man. Man is evil at present, okay? And there's, nobody needs to question that, that man is evil. 
look what happened in Genesis 6. After like about only 10 generations, the earth had become so corrupt. It was so filled with evil that God was grieved at his heart and he had to destroy at least most, almost all, everyone except for Noah and his family and to restart, let's say, and to refill and replenish the earth as he had asked Adam to do. So the present of age of man who is evil at present, okay? But his race has been chosen to be transformed into the new creatures in Christ who are the image of God. So even though man has been evil and is still evil, there is something else that is going on, which is my other topic that I've been talking about on Sundays, the image of God, that the purpose for which God created us is to not leave us as evil, corrupt, you know, vessels of clay that are easily broken, but to transform us into his very own image to make copies of himself. And that is the age in which all this would happen is the Iron Age, which is the shortest of the ages. So most of the history of creation happened before us. Okay? It involved creatures like the angels and the sons of God, who probably didn't even have a clue that one day God was going to make this creature called man, who would be the creature, the central creature in God's creation for God himself would incarnate in this creature, not in the angels or in the other flesh and blood creatures that came before man, which were the sons of God. So creation, like I said, in the golden age, let's talk about the golden age. Okay, so what happened in the golden age? Of course, in the golden age, everything was being built. There was no sin yet. There was no corruption. There was no evil. There was no decay. Nobody was bombing places and destroying things. They were just building. So this building, I believe, went on for a very long time because God's creation is so gigantic that we cannot even begin to have a clue as to the size and dimensions of it. And that is why, you know, people who try to figure God out and think that they can understand him, they have, they're fools because he is so big as we can determine by the size of his creation of which we only know a very small percentage. But even that is so big for us in comparison to us that it really leaves us in awe. And, you know, God tells us that, you know, he, he, he reveals himself through his creation. He speaks of his, his creation speaks of him. And this creation that we see on the earth, it is only a very small portion of all of his creation, which is very, very large. So creation begins with the city, with the heaven, okay, a singular place, which is a city, the city of God, from where God rules, reigns, and manages his creation. It is the administrative center of all creation. The heaven should be distinguished from the heavens plural, which are not cities, but are celestial bodies. Okay? So the heaven is a city. The heavens are like the sun, moon, and the stars, which are seen above the earth. The reason I keep showing pictures of fantastic cityscapes like this one here is to emphasize that the heaven is a vast technological wonder city with an untold in number of inhabitants that came into existence with a very, very long time before Adam, who is the father of present day mankind, okay? So heaven is not like, you know, a bricks, I mean, some kind of clay huts or something. It is like a fantastic place, like something out of a science fiction movie, except nobody can even imagine it because no man has ever seen it. All these stories that you read about people dying and going to heaven and all that, don't believe any of that, okay? Even the apostle Paul, when he was caught up to the third heaven, he said that it was not lawful for what he heard and what he saw. He said it was not lawful for man. It was not even, not just lawful, what that actually he was saying was, that it is not even possible for man. Man doesn't have the words to describe what is up there. Okay, so all these stories about, yeah, I died and went to heaven. Then they, they are not, those people, no. They are not, they didn't go to heaven. Not the heaven of God, okay. The devil showed them some things and uh, that's what they run around trying to tell people that the heaven is like. So the verses of scripture that prove that the heaven 
as opposed to the heavens is the city of God. You can read that in Psalm 46, verse 4. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Psalm 48, 2. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Okay. This city of Psalm 48, it, it may be something different than the city of heaven that is up there in, 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 at the highest point of creation, but that is a topic for another time. But nonetheless, it is called the city of God. Psalm 87, verse 3, glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. Then in Hebrews 11:10, which I will talk about in a little bit later, he says, for he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11:16. but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Revelation 21, talking about the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, okay, which is a city. So it stands to reason that the present heaven, the old heaven, is also a city. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21, verse 10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Okay, so yeah, so, so there is no doubt that the heaven up there is not like a, you know, a celestial body like the sun or a moon or something. It is actually a, a city, okay? And I believe it's a city of very, very gigantic dimensions. Right. Okay. So now, continuing, the 1611 authorized version is the only Bible that I know of which separates Genesis 1-1 into two clauses by adding a comma after the word heaven. In the beginning, God created the heaven comma, and this comma indicates that the creation of the heaven and the earth were not simultaneous events, but were separated by a gap of time. This is the first gap found in the Bible, and the gap is in verse 1 itself. So the gap theory, which tells us that there is a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, it's been now, I'm revising it and calling it the gaps theory, because the first gap doesn't come in Genesis 1-2, it's actually in, Gen in Genesis verse 1, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 itself. And it is the gap of time between the creation of the city of heaven and its inhabitants and then the, then, the, then the earth and its inhabitants, okay? So the creation of the city of heaven was most likely accompanied by the creation of the inhabitants of heaven, the various races of angels. When God prepares a place, like you said, it's a place of habitation. Heaven is a place of habitation, as we shall see. The earth is a place of habitation. So just like when he was making the earth, he had made the inhabitants. So I would assume that when he was making the heaven, he was also making the inhabitants that would populate that, that place. So the first age of creation, the golden age, can be separated into two major divisions with a gap of time between them. Therefore, the correct order of creation in the Bible is as follows. See, again, like I've done many videos on the various ages of creation of the gap theory, etc. But like, like any, any person that, is a, that, that you know, studies the Bible, even if we are a teacher, we are also learning. So there are new things that I'm learning that I'm sharing with you because like, for example, today talking about the gaps, and how even the first golden age can be divided into two separate ages, you know, within the first, within that major age, there are two major time periods. So that is something which, you know, I have only come to realize recently, and that is why I have not shared this information before. So the first age of creation, the golden age can be separated into two major divisions with a gap of time between them. 
Therefore, the correct order of creation in the Bible is, a, is as follows. Creation of the city of heaven, the city of God. This is Genesis 1, verse 1, and I've called it 1a. And then the creation of intelligent life, the city of heaven and creation of intelligent life, beginning with the host of angels, the host of heaven, as they're called, of creatures of spirit. And these we can read about in Job chapter 38, verse 7. It tells us when the morning stars sang together, morning stars, of course, representing angels, angelic beings, comma, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So again, the morning stars sang together, the angel, angels and all the sons of God, they are also separate. That, that verse is also separated into two clauses. So that shows us one more time, perhaps, that there is also going to be a time period. There's something, you know, some separation between these two, two species or these two types of intelligent creatures that God first made, the angelic races and the sons of God races. So the first part of the golden age is the creation of the city of heaven and the intelligent inhabitants of that heaven. Of course, God himself, and then also the angelic host, and then the creation of other intelligent light, which are the flesh and blood creatures called the sons of God in Job chapter 38. And we can also read about them in Genesis chapter six and the creation of the earth. And that's the second clause in Genesis 1.1, God created in the beginning, God created the heaven. And then he created the earth some point in time later on. And that later on part could literally be thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even millions of years of time apart. We don't really know. So by understanding the correct order of creation, we can understand that there were gaps of time between the following events. Creation of the city of heaven, which would be populated by intelligent angelic races, by creatures formed of spirit, not flesh. And then the creation of the earth, meant to be inhabited by flesh and blood, intelligent creatures called the sons of God in Genesis and in the book of Job. How long did each one of these creations take? And how long were the gaps of time between each event? That we will find out at some point in time later on when we have a fullness of knowledge that will come to us. Because cities on earth, okay, this is something again, when I was talking about the dimensions of uh, the city of heaven, because cities on earth, even very large ones are rather limited in area compared to the size of the earth itself. We generally assume that the heavenly city of God, the present heaven must also occupy only a small area of the heavenly realms. However, I'm of the opinion that the heaven is very large and filled with an untold number the Bible tells us there are like an innumerable company of angels, innumerable. If God calls them innumerable, then there's no man that has any possibility of ever counting how many angels there are. The heaven is very large and, and filled with an untold number of living creatures. It may well cover the entirety of the heavenly realm above the waters that are above the firmament or at least a substantial area above. Now, this is what I mean, okay? Here you're looking at the, at, at the screen of our, you know, flat earth, okay? Although in a picture, we can look at these dimensions and they don't look that big, but, you know, just try when you go outside, like I said in the last video, look up at the sky and turn around, do a 360 degree, look as far as you can and see how far that firmament extends. So if, if this is the earth, okay, with the four corners, and there is a firmament above it, which is a roof. It has a roof. And I would venture to say that the, that, the, that the place called heaven, the heaven, the city of heaven, I'm not talking about the waters above the firmament and something that may exist above them before on top and the very higher, highest point would be this heaven. This city of heaven could actually you know, stretch right across that firmament we don't know how big it is. It could be very, very gigantic, okay? So it is not a small place. It's not like, you know, we even the very large cities on earth, like New York City or Mexico City or Mumbai or something, you know, they, they have a substantial area that they cover. But when you compare it to the size of the earth itself, it's very small, okay? So 
I would say that the city of heaven is is very large, very, very large place. How big it is and how big, because the bigger it is, the bigger our God is. And that's why I'm trying to, you know, teach this here that our God is not a small God. One of the, one of the, one of the deceptions of the so-called church is that they always want to put God into a small box and, you know, make him out to be very small. Okay. Because they don't talk about his creation. They don't talk about his works. The, the psalmist talks about these wondrous works that, you know, you get his works are without number. Okay. He is busy in so many areas and so many with so many different people and so many different creatures that we can't even begin to imagine it. Okay. And therefore, everything about creation is much bigger. The number of inhabitants that are in it, even intelligent creatures, the number of angels, the number of devils, even they are like beyond numbering. So it is everything is so big that you know you and I can't even begin to fathom it. So whether the city of heaven or the heavenly realms of the earth, all places created, whether the city of heaven or heavenly realms or the earth, these are all places that have been created by God and they're meant for habitation by creatures that are appropriate for the world for which they have been created. Whether spirit creatures like angels meant to inhabit the heavenly realms or flesh and blood for terrestrial bodies like the earth. The word world as distinguished from the earth means a place of habitation and worlds exist not only on the earth, but everywhere in creation in the heavens on the earth, in the seas, and also under the earth. As I said, you know, that's right. There are so many different worlds that are inhabited by so many different creatures that we can't even begin to imagine. And yet God is involved with each one of them. He has a purpose for each one of them. And all of these creations, they have a history. They began at a certain point in time. They grew over a certain period of time. And then many of them, have been destroyed and rebuilt a number of times already. In Genesis 124, we can read, you know, when we're talking about that places are always meant for habitation by living creatures. In Genesis 124, we read, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and the beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so, okay? So we can we read that, that God made all these beasts that were going, in addition to man, of course, that were going to inhabit the earth one day. So does that same principle not also apply to the heavenly realms? As in Genesis 124, God created living creatures for inhabiting the earth at the very beginning of creation when God at the very beginning of creation, when God began to build the city of heaven, he also created living creatures who would inhabit the heaven. And these are not creatures of flesh as the ones on the earth, but they are creatures of spirit. Okay. Now, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, in verse beginning in verse 5. And out of the midst there came out the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and the sparkle like the color of burnished brass. And they had hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. So, as in Genesis 1, the earth was filled with living creatures. It stands to reason that the heaven was also filled with living creatures. They're called living creatures in Ezekiel, many times in this chapter, very interesting chapter. It was filled with living creatures and the heaven is also filled with living creatures who have existed from the very, very beginning, long before even the earth came into existence. So the first half of the golden age, the age of building and construction was a time when the heaven, not yet the heavens was being built, when the foundations of heaven were being laid and in wisdom and by planning, God was making and building this wondrous place of which no living man has ever had a glimpse. 
even for, from a short verse of scripture like Hebrews 11.10, we can learn a great deal. So this is what we read in Hebrews 11.10. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The city of God has foundations, and his builder and maker is God, who, see, he built it, he made it, he built the foundations for it. Again, it talks about planning. It talks about purposing. And he's not talking about creating something as a ruined wasteland. Okay? Everything is done in order by God. And if God is a builder and maker of the city of heaven, does it not stand to reason that it was not just instantaneously that he made waved a magic wand and suddenly this whole city that covers the whole heavenly realms came into existence. No, it must have been built over time. And the angels and all these other creatures that inhabited it, they must have come in order as well. They didn't all probably just pop up, you know, one day. There must have been a time when, uh, like with Adam, God made Adam and Eve and, you know, they were the ones that were building and they were going to be the inhabitants of the earth and they were going to build cities as they grew in number, that is exactly how it must have had in hap happened in, in the case of heaven itself. And the thing is that all that happened even before the earth was made. So that is the first half of the golden age, right? As the heaven was built, you know, with God's temple for sure, and other buildings and structures that we cannot even begin to imagine, God must have also had to begun to make the inhabitants as he did with the earth. Up there is a world called heaven, which is a city and that world, like the worlds built by Adam and his children on, on earth, must have grown in size as more and more inhabitants were added to the celestial city by God. This brings us to the creatures called cherubim who were most likely the highest of God's creatures and who were and are found to this very day in the very presence of God himself. The most famous of this race of the cherubim, of course, was the anointed cherub, whose story we read in Ezekiel 28. He is the creature who first introduced evil in God's creation. And it was the arrival of evil that would bring an end to the golden age and we would transition into the silver age, okay? But the events of the golden age themselves were, were just incredible time of building, the building of the city of heaven, then the building of the earth, then the building of the heavens. God said he stretched out the heavens. All that took time, my friends, a very, very long time. So as I said, the majority of the history of creation, it lies in the past. It is in our past. It is not, you know, it, and it's not like a few years ago. Some of it, the very beginning of it goes back, probably in my opinion, at least like some millions of years, if not even longer. Okay, so we'll come back to the story of the Anonic Cherub, who was the first of God's creatures to turn against the creator. However, for now, I want to emphasize that despite being falsely taught for so long that the creation of heaven and the heavenly realms were instantaneous event, I would have to disagree. Creation began with the heaven and the, and first, and the first of the races of angels, and there are many races of angels, okay? There's not only one, just one type of angels, including the cherubim that would inhabit the celestial city along with their creator. Therefore, the golden of age of creation, now long passed into history, can be divided into, number one, the celestial creation of heaven and the living creatures of heaven. And two, the terrestrial creation of earth and the corporeal flesh and blood creatures called the sons of God. This was the age subdivided into two when evil did not yet exist. So, the gap that exists in Genesis 1-1 is that in the beginning, God created the heaven. That creation of the heaven itself is an age in itself in which that heaven grew and was filled with these inhabitants. And it was then the second half of that age, after this gap of the creation of heaven, God turned his attention to creating the earth and to creating the inhabitants of the earth, the sons of God. 
for the longest time, I thought that God made the angels and the sons of God all at once. But now I'm of the opinion that these angelic races were created first, including the cherubim. This is why that an only cherub thought that he has such a, you know, the right to be the rulers and to be the, uh, you know, to, to be the king of creation because they had existed for much longer than anyone else. And later on, the sons of God would come into existence. God would create them when he began to create the earth because the earth was created for these creatures of flesh. So I think my friends for today, I'm going to uh, pause this here. And then I'm going to keep working on this presentation to build a whole history of creation. And we will now talk next about uh, the creation of the earth and the, the, these creatures called the sons of God. And because we have a little bit more about their history than we do about the angelic races, we read a little bit about the angels and the evil that they did, especially in Ezekiel 28, but not a whole lot. And as I said, that that history is so long ago that whatever those worlds were back in that day, the, uh, the heavenly realms, the what was on the earth and the golden and the silver age, it probably not even a trace remains of it. There is so much history has already happened. Even the earth itself is probably like, you know, layers upon layers of worlds that one on top of the other, if you were to keep digging down, we would keep finding more and more ruins. It's that old and that much has happened here already. And that's the wonder of God, that he had a plan. And this plan was such a long and laborious one, yet he has patiently tolerated everything that evil had to throw at him because he had to bring us to the place where he would be able to make copies of himself by using evil because absolute evil absolute darkness would take a long time to become absolute like god is absolutely good okay that is the related topic which i'm talking about and again on sunday at 10 o'clock i will i will continue with that so at this moment i'm going to stop this for now and before i finish off here today i would like to take a few minutes to open it up to uh you know, my friends who want to uh, might want to come on and uh, share with us if uh, if they choose to, if anybody wants to make any comments or to, you know, have any questions, please go right ahead. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to finish off here and I want to thank you all for taking the time to join here in this in this fellowship, which God willing, we will continue to do for as long as we can okay all right so i wanted to say that uh i think it's probably logical to think that when the earth was destroyed uh before adam was made uh where, where it goes through genesis and the creation of six days uh god probably did recreate the sun and the moon and, and you know, the, the beasts of the earth and the fish in the sea in six days. Uh, do you think that would be logical to say? I mean, I understand what you're saying. Uh, and I agree that it's been over a long period of time the heaven was made and then the earth was made and then ages went by. But what we read in the Bible about the six days of creation, I would have to think it's probably logical to say, yeah, God probably did make these uh, recreate the the sun again uh, that was darkened, and you know, you know what I mean, and brought everything back to life in six days in the exact order that He mentions in the Bible. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, just hold on one second. Yes, I I, I would. Uh... Yeah, you're right, Gary. I mean, we will get to that part because, you know, that, that history that you're talking about, like I said, that is, uh, that is bringing us into the Iron Age. So we are, uh, you know, quite far removed from that time in our, you know, where we are in this uh, history of creation series right now. But yes, that, that is absolutely right, that uh, when God began the process of recreation, he was, uh, 
it was, you know, it was, it, 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 he said he did it in six days, so he did it in six days. But those are not the six days that the original creation itself was not something that occurred over six days. That took way longer than that. So, right. yes, that, that Genesis 1, I you know, when uh, I get to uh, the time of the recreation, which happens after Genesis 1, 2, like in most of history, the most of history of creation, I would say maybe 80 to 90 percent, maybe even more, is, is in those two verses of scripture, Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And uh, what we have from Genesis 1, 3 onwards is, is a very, very short period of time. Like you said, it probably only about 6,000 years, whereas the, what came before could easily have been like, you know, 6 million or 600 million or who knows how long. It could have been, you know, much, 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 much longer than that. So therefore, that's that we haven't quite arrived at that point yet. But you are right, though, in your understanding. Anybody else? Yes, brother uh, Paul. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just want to thank. Yeah, I just want to thank you for these uh, teachings, which I'm thoroughly enjoying. Uh, I just want to appreciate uh, you for taking the effort to setting a time apart to teach us, which is amazing. Thank you so much. I'm really, we are really blessed by it. Yeah. All right, brother Sebastian. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see you out there. I might not pray for you guys that everything is, uh, you know, it's uh, difficult times, but uh, thank yeah. you. You know, this is Pastor Sebastian, for those who don't know, and, uh, you know, looks, uh, he's uh, he has a flock of many, many uh, very poor and, you know, hardworking people, and therefore we should keep him in our prayers and uh, support yeah. in any way that we can. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Yes. Yes, thanks for praying, brother. Yeah. God bless you. All right. Uh, anyone else, my brothers and sisters? All right. In that case, you know, let's call it a night here and uh, have a, uh, you know, just uh, pray here. Gary, my brother, yeah. go ahead and pray the Lord's Prayer, like, you know, which uh, which is uh, which is what you, we should uh we should always say a prayer, like you said last time, before we finish. And so if you are, if you're still on, go ahead and pray that for us. smiling. Okay, you guys ready? Yeah. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. Okay. God bless you all, my brothers. See you, uh, see you next time.